It is a blessing to be together. Thomas, thank you. I caught the theme of your songs, especially, you know, to be a comfort to us in a time of uncertainty. And isn't it wonderful to know the rock of our salvation, the one in whom we can trust, no matter whether the sun is shining or the clouds have gathered and it is pouring rain. We know that it can be refreshing because that's how our God takes it and works it together for our good. And we have a wonderful example of his love set before us in the study that we have been doing on the tabernacle. We have been on it for, uh, I believe this is our seventh lesson in it, not counting our review. And we are coming to the climax. We are coming to the point that we have been building all along up into this point. And uh, I can hardly wait for us to go through that veil and through uh, into the final uh, piece of the, the furniture that is in our tabernacle. But just before we get there, I need to back up just slightly, not only to bring us onto the same page, but I was texted a question last week in the middle of the study. Unfortunately, I didn't see it till long after Zoom was over. But I had brought up that uh, mixed in with the showbread uh, on the, the table of showbread was frankincense. And that frankincense at a certain time would be put into the fire. And the question was asked of me, why frankincense? Well, I could give you our good Jewish answer, which is because that's what God said. <laughs> but when we look at the meaning behind frankincense in Scripture, we find that it's something that was very precious and something that was valuable. It was used by the priests. Uh, it would be used in the time of offering uh, to the Lord. Uh, even though it wasn't at the, along with the sacrifice, there's still other offerings that were being given to the Lord. And I believe that what it was showing, because if you remember, it's one of the three gifts presented to Yeshua when he was born. They came bearing, well, shortly after he was born, not at his um, birth, but, but uh, within a short time. They were given gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And the frankincense was to be re revealing that he would be doing the work of the high priest, because it was the high priest that would use the frankincense in the sacrificing. It, I'm sorry, in the offering. I keep saying sacrificing, but in the offerings that were being given to the Lord. Uh, it's also interesting that frankincense was used much like we use tea leaves, and it was um, thought to be like a sedative, that it would uh, enhance the mood, it would help breathing to be easier. That's why they mixed it with other things, but offered it to um, those on the cross who were uh, suffering from uh, suffocation at that point was to make that easier for them. Of course, it was only meant as a stopgap for them because of their bitter end. But for us, we also see that it was meant to be um, more than just an enhancer or making it easier, but it was to be medicinal. It was to heal wounds like an astringent or an antiseptic. And when we see our high priest in his role of bringing healing to us spiritually, then I think we begin to get the de deeper meaning of frankincense than what we realize just on the surface. So uh, keep that in mind and remember also that uh, we have come, without going back through the PowerPoint, we're going to start our PowerPoint where we left off. Uh, later we'll go back through and we'll look at it all again. But remember we've come through the opening in the courtyard, which was the first opening and it was likened to Yochanan uh, John chapter 14 and verse 6 where Yeshua said I am and then he added to that great I am I am the way and then we saw that it went from there that we came to the holy place the holy building that we've been in here recently and at the entrance through that veil was called I am the truth and we saw that the truth was there the testimony and the truth was there by the uh, but what we saw in the holy place, which was not what you're seeing now, that was out in the courtyard. Uh, we're going to start with 27. Thank you. Uh, what was just before um, the courtyard, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. What was just, when we went in the holy building, we get, went in through the truth, we went in through that second way in, and that's where we saw the candle stand on the north side, in the candle stand we saw he is the light of the world. We see the table showbread on the south side of the wall and we know that he is uh, our bread. Our daily need is met, he is our sustenance. 
we saw right in front of this curtain that you're seeing now that we're going to go through in just a, a short time but right in front of the curtain we saw that there was the altar of incense and we saw that the incense was being offered up into the presence of the Lord symbolic of our prayers being lifted up but also I think symbolically of how we can be lifted up and brought into the presence of our holy God and the way that we can be brought into his presence was the way that this whole tabernacle was showing us that we were coming through the way the truth and we're going to come through the curtain that is the life again those three are from Yohanan John chapter 14 verse 6 the way the truth and the life as we're approaching this inner veil inside the holy building we're going to be going into the holy of holies the most holy place and as we are approaching the veil we see that the veil conceals the veil is hiding what's behind it what is behind it we know because we've had the, the ability to study ahead we know that it separates us from God's holy presence that is this holy presence that was was I, I don't want to say contain that God chose to bring his holy presence into the holy of holies remember the mishkan the temple the tabernacle was the place for God's presence to dwell dwell excuse me with man but this veil was representative of something separating us from that and what that is is sin sin was separating man from being able to go into the presence of the holy God and we're going to see that something happened to that veil at a specific time in history and it's significant what did happen to it if you have your Bible and you want to look I'm going to Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 to 22 I had my phone set for it and I have lost it but hopefully there we go okay Hebrews chapter 10 and even though that's in the Brit Hadashah, we know that it's a book that is building on our law, on our Torah, it's giving us the fulfillment. We know that the original covenant, things were concealed, and in the new covenant, the Brit Hadashah, promised by Jeremiah, Jeremiah, our prophet, we know that it would be revealed. And it's this revelation that we're seeing fully. When I start with verse 19, I read, So brethren, or brothers, we have confidence to use the way into the holiest place. In other words, what it's saying is we have confidence that we can go into the holiest place, not just the holy place, but the holiest, the holy of holies place, opened by the blood of Yeshua. He inaugurated it for us as a new and a living way. Here's your life, new and living way, through the perchot, the perchet, the, the veil, by means of his flesh. We also have a great Cohen, a great priest over God's household. Therefore, let us approach the holiest place with a sincere heart, in the full assurance that comes from trusting, with our hearts sprinkled clean from a bad conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Remember, we've been going through a process before we got to this point that would have brought us the cleansing that, that is being referred to there, that the Word of God is that pure water that cleanses us and it, in essence brings us to a clean conscience. They were not that way yet, but what happened, how did the, the Lord, how did Yeshua, he, it says by means of his flesh, how did Yeshua make this way in through the veil? If you know your story, um, your, I'm sorry, if you know your history, <laughs> you know his story. You know that at the time of the crucifixion, when he was shedding his pure and his sinless blood, when it was being spilled out for the forgiveness of mankind for all time, we know that something very significant happened in the, in the temple. At that time, and we read about this in Matthew, Mattathiah, he was writing, remember, to a Jewish audience, and so he gives us this history in Matthew 27, verses 50 to 51. And I'm going to turn to that and read them for you. Matthew 27 verses 50 and 51 and I'm choosing to read it that you might know it's not my words but this is the historical record that was given at this time and I'm on something it takes just a moment to get there but I will be with it in a moment okay at the moment the perchet the, the veil in the temple was ripped in two from top to bottom okay at what moment it said at that moment this happened 
if we backed up into a little earlier in chapter 27, we realize that this is when Yeshua was dying on the cross. He had just been quoted in verse 46, the saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which in translation is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It is believed that at the moment that Yeshua was saying these words, this is when he became the sin sacrifice for us, for all mankind. And holy God could not look on sin. So as he became that sin sacrifice, it's believed that God turned his back for that moment on his son, on Yeshua, who felt the separation, knew that in his in that simple, not the simple state because he was not sin, but in becoming that sin offering, taking that sin on himself, it separated him for that moment from Jehovah, from God the Father. And it was at that moment he cried out in that agony, which I believe was the agony he was facing in the garden earlier when he prayed, let, that, let this cup pass from before me, nevertheless not my will, but your will be done. He was willing to concede and to lay down his life physically, but more importantly than, than just the physical suffering, he was willing to take on the spiritual role of that great high priest who was now making the sacrifice for all mankind. This is when he is the Lamb of God sacrificed for the sin of the world. And remember, Yochanan John said in the very beginning when he first saw him coming into his ministry, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, at that moment that his blood was shed, that it might open the way in a new way, as Hebrew said, in an inaugurated way into a new and a living life, this is what he established for us, and God showed this to us by he being the one who ripped this veil in two. You notice there's no opening in the middle. The high priest would go around one of the sides. He would not go through the middle, but this veil, thicker than a man's hand, 15 feet high, ripped not from bottom up as if man had taken a hold of it and started to, to shred it, but from the very top all the way down to the bottom. It was suddenly rent in two, and it was pulled open, and the high priest that probably was, or at least the priest who was in the holy place or near there at the time, would have at that moment been able to see right into the very mercy seat, the place where the Shekhinah glory of God dwelt, the place where God said his presence was there. And the purpose of, of opening it up was showing us that, the, that by the uh, tearing of Messiah's flesh, it was making open that veil for us so that we could now enter into his life and into his very presence. That is a beautiful picture of what's being represented and, and therefore it's very fitting that the colors we see in the, in the materials used on this inner veil were blue, our heavenly color, purple, our color of royalty, scarlet, our color that speaks to the sacrifice that was given. And though you can barely see it in this picture, another rendition would show it more, there was also white linen used because in his righteousness, our sins are washed from scarlet to white. We are made white as snow. White being a, a picture of purity, the holiness that we're brought into, which brings us to the, um, the uh, design that you see drawn on this curtain, which was a picture of the cherubim. Remember the cherubim were the angels that we were introduced to. They're one class of angels, there are many that we were introduced to them all the way back in Bereshit, all the way back at the time of the Garden of Eden. And we see all through scripture the cherubim are always protectors of God's holiness. They represent God's holiness. And we will see in further detail their shape in having to do with this mercy seat that's right inside this curtain as we go in very shortly. In our next PowerPoint, uh, actually I think we can hold it here, I think we're on my next one. <laughs> We see four pillars. These pillars represented the four Gospels that speak of Yeshua's work. We call them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in our English. And it's interesting that all four wrote about the time of Yeshua and his uh, earthly uh, life, but they all wrote to a different audience from a different angle, different perspective, with a different reason. Now, none of them disagreed with the others. They might give another detail, they might enhance the pictures, we put them together, we might get a fuller picture. We don't have in each gospel every single story, 
but some of them are repeated in, in more than one. But uh, we see that, that it took four different angles, four different books, four different authors with four different audiences to look at the multifaceted existence of our Savior for us, who He was, what He was representing, what He was doing for us. And I can tell you just in a, a line, because it's not the main focus for tonight, but it's an important point. Matthew wrote to a Jewish audience, and he presented Yeshua as king of the Jews. Melch, king of the Jews. We have Mark that showed him as a servant. Remember our prophets that told us he would come humble, lowly, as a servant. He would be riding on a donkey, not coming in majesticness. So Mark brings out the servant side of Yeshua. Luke brought out the Son of Man. That spoke to show very much his humanity. And we see his humanity here, here also because we're going to see the materials that were used in the pillars, and I should have brought that out a moment ago, is they were made of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Remember, gold spoke to his deity that he was fully God, but also fully man, and the wood is speaking to that humanity. Remember, the acacia tree was a very humble uh, shrubbery-like tree. It was not anything that would have been exalted and lifted up. And also, if you can notice, the sockets for these pillars are silver. And remember, in Scripture, silver speaks to us of redemption, of atonement. So uh, we see very much this picture of this servant that came to atone for us. And Luke spoke to his humanity. The Son of Man was a messianic title and at the same time a very human title. He was the Son, capital S-O-N, the Son of God who always existed. Remember Yeshia, Isaiah said, and to us the Son is given. The child was born, but the Son was given because the Son always existed. And Yochanan John brings us to that point. He presented him as Son of God. He's showing the, the God side of him, where Luke showed more of the human side of him. And we have John telling us right in the very beginning, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. We know he's referring to Yeshua because verse 14 of that first chapter tells us that he tabernacled, came and dwelt among man. And we know that the Word that was in the beginning, that was with God and was God, dwelt in a human form. We called his name Yeshua. Remember, when God chose to slip into our time and into space, he put on a face, and we call him Yeshua, Jesus. So before we even come through this, this curtain, we have a beautiful portrayal of our Messiah as God himself in human form redeeming us, that we can have atonement on the altar and be in his very presence. Now this veil was positioned right before the ark. We're going to go in uh, shortly. In fact, go ahead and go on in. Roger, take us in. Oh, this is another idea of what it might have looked like, and you can begin to see some of the other colors and things that I uh, was presenting. I forgot we had two views. But we come in now. We're coming past now. The showbread, the candlestick, the altar of incense, and we're going to go in. There we go, to the ark. Is that not beautiful? If we were in person, I have a very small replica that was uh, loaned it to me to show to you, but we didn't make it to uh, where we can come together. So when we do come together, I will uh, bring it at that time. It's uh, miniature size, but it looks very much like this and just kind of brings it home all the more. But this is our highlight. This is beautiful to our eye. It's uh, um, the, where we've come past that curtain now that separated the holy place and the holy of holies, and we've come into the very presence where, I'm sorry, the very place where God's presence dwelt. And again, that curtain was not torn open until the, the crucifixion, the death of our Messiah who bought life for us out of his death. As we look at this ark, we notice and understand that the ark is a place of safekeeping. And therefore, it was made like a chest. We have chests that we keep things in today. I don't want to take you to the pirate's treasure because he was not a pirate. But we know the pirates kept their treasures in chests. 
we know that, that the olden days we had the girls with their hope chests that would put everything in for that hopeful day of wedding. Well, we are going to be married. We are married to our, we are the bride um, of our Messiah and our Savior. We can look at it that way. But it was a place of safekeeping. We're going to see that there is something kept in that ark. We'll talk about that in just a bit. But I want you to realize this is the only piece of furniture in the Holy of Holies. It is in two pieces, even though it looks like one here. We'll look to that in just a moment or two. But before we do, again, we're looking at acacia wood that has been overlaid with gold within and without. There's your hint where your two pieces are. This is, has a removable lid, and it can be looked into. And when you look into it, you would see gold all the way, not just on the outside, but inside and outside. We see again the top all the way around looks like a crown, again because it's speaking of the crown of gold, showing that our Messiah would be exalted and that he would come into his glory. Now let's look at the contents, and I think we have a picture. Okay, that shows you how the mercy seat lid would be lifted. And now we're going to see and talk about what was in the ark, when it was in the ark also. Uh, the first that we notice uh, is the unbroken tablets of the law. And that speaks to us, I stress the word unbroken, I'm sure you heard that, because that speaks to us of his perfect life. That his life was not uh, compromised in any way, that never sin entered into his life, there was never anything to blemish. Remember the sacrifice had to be complete, it had to be whole, it had to be without blemish, it had to be a perfect picture. And so we read in Devarim, in Deuteronomy, chapter 10, and we read in verses uh, 1 through 5. At that time, Adonai said to me, Cut yourself two stone tablets like the first ones. Come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. So here's our ark being made. The tablets had to be the, the second set, not the first set that Moshe broke when he came down the mountain and found the people were already in such sin that, that it broke his heart and he broke the commandments, uh, showing that they'd already broken them. And this second set, it, uh, as God is speaking, he continues and says, I will inscribe on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke, and you are to put them in the ark. Now Moshe is speaking, so I made an ark of acacia wood, cut two stone tablets like the first, then climbed the mountain with the two tablets in my hand, he inscribed the tablets with the same inscription as before, the Ten Commandments, or the Ten Words, but it means commandments, which Adonai proclaimed to you from the fire on the mountain the day of the assembly, and Adonai gave them to me. I turned, came down the mountain, and put the tablets in the ark I had made, and there they remain, as Adonai ordered me. So we know at least for a period of time, the, the second set of tablets unbroken, showing that it speaks to his perfect life. Only one has been able to keep every commandment of God and keep them perfectly. And we know that in another uh, place in Scripture, it tells us that if we break even one of the law, we've broken it all. If we even simplify it just to the ten and not take it to all the commandments we see in Scripture, our uh, Forefathers tell us that there were 613 commandments in entirety, and that would be ceremonial commandments and, and commandments in relation to the temple, that sort of thing. But if we even just bring it down just to these ten, if you break even one, you have broken all the law. Because of that, we know that, that we are in need, and this mercy seat reminds us that he's going to be pouring out his mercy which means he, well, we have mercy and we have grace. Mercy is not receiving what we deserve, and grace is receiving what we don't deserve. Together, the two are a beautiful picture for us of what we attain when we come into Messiah. You notice a little bowl. That bowl is a, an artist's picture of a pot of the man, or as you say, manna. And that's to remind us that, that he is our bread of life. We go back to Yochanan, who refers to that for us. John chapter 6, and we read in verse 51. Read it, John 6 on your own at another point in time, because much more is said of the bread than just this one point. But the one point I want to bring out to us right now, in verse 51, we read, 
I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Furthermore, the bread that I will give is my own flesh, and I will give it for the life of the world. Remember, we've come through the veil that gives us life. And his being represented through the bread, bread is the sustenance of life. It is what we need uh, daily to survive, we must eat. And uh, this is a picture then of Yeshua being all that we need, that he is our sustenance, and we are filled and fulfilled in him. We read also this in the book of Hebrews again, written to our Hebrew people. In chapter 9 and verse 4, we read there, uh, okay, we're jumping into behind the, the, the second veil was the tent called the holiest place. It's verse 3. Verse 4, which had the golden altar for burning incense and the Ark of the Covenant. And we know that that golden altar was right in front of the veil, then the, the Ark right behind the veil, entirely covered with gold. In the Ark were the gold jar containing the man, the manna, Aharon's rod, Aaron's rod that sprouted, and the stone tablets of the covenant. So we've already looked and seen that the law was in the mercy seat. We saw that the man, the manna, was in the mercy seat, and mentioned here was the third one that, or the third thing that was put in there, and that is Aharon's rod, Aaron's rod that budded. Let me take you before I go back in history to to John 11 and verse 25. And in John 11, in verse 25, we read, Yeshua said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever puts his trust in me will live even if he dies. So he's speaking of a resurrected life, a life that comes out of death. When we turn in this same book, the John speaking uh, in chapter 14, we come to chapter 14 and verse 19, where he says, sorry, be right there, where he says, in just a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live, you too will live. Yeshua was hinting to the time that after his death, burial, and resurrection, he would be ascending back into heaven, and we, they, his Talmudim in his, his, in his day, and us to this day are not able to see him, but we know that he is alive, and because he is we know that we're guaranteed our eternal life in his very presence also. Now if I go back in history without looking it up, um, just telling you very quickly why Aharon's rod, because when uh, uh, Korah felt that Moshe and Haron, being in the same family, were taking on too much responsibility as the priests for the people and argued with it, God said, okay, I'll show you who my choice is. Each uh, tribe is to take a, a stick and to place them in the holy place uh, or in the temple. I don't remember, I'm sorry, whether it was in the holy place or not, but brought them into the tabernacle and leave them there overnight. Each one had taken a, a, like a limb from the tree. They had carved the name of their tribe on it so that everyone would know whose is whose. They were brought in 12 sticks and in the morning there was only one that even though these all went in looking dead because they'd been broken off from what would give them their, their sustenance to life, there was one that not only looked alive, not only had budded, blossomed, had fruit on it, that fruit being almonds, and almonds are a picture of the first fruits of the first resurrection, but it also had, had just sprung forth into entire life, and that was Aharon's, that was Aaron's. So we see in this the picture again of the promised eternal life, that resurrected life that comes out of death. And that only comes by way of Yeshua's shed blood on the mercy seat for us. Uh, let's go to our next PowerPoint. I believe we want the next one. Okay, we're going to look just at the lid of the chest. It would have been 45 inches long and 27 inches wide. And what we want to see and understand is that the mercy seat signified to atone or to cover. It's the word propitiation that's used in Romans 3.25, but propitiation really means atonement. It was, uh, it, when we have our sins atoned, they were being uh, completely covered. They were not removed until Yeshua shed blood, but they were covered as if they had never existed. 
And then when his shed blood was placed there, because now perfect sinless blood was placed there, then the sins could be washed away in a, in a way that is referred to now. But this is the very place, the seat of God, where justice would be demanded, that a holy God must not just wink at sin, overlook sin, brush it aside, but it had to be dealt with. Yet in the very seat of justice, where judgment should be given out, this was the place where mercy was given to us. Again, you see the chariot beam showing his holiness, and this is what we're referring to, the holiness of God. I've already brought out to you that the lid itself was pure gold, and that speaks again of his deity. The chariot beam guarding each end of it, and it is believed that their wings came over as if to touch together, uh, that the cherry beam were guarding his holiness because that's where his very presence dwelt. Remember when we looked at the cherry beam before, when God would move in heaven, even when his whole throne would move, it would literally be the cherry beam that were moving it, and we even uh, get a picture in scripture, I think it was in Daniel's prophecy, where it sounds as if he is standing on the cherry beam, that they are holding him up, not that he needed to be held up, but that they are just all around and protecting his his holiness, that nothing was going to come into this area that was not pure. We know that the throne of God is in the midst of Israel. That is the promise. We read of that in Psalm 80 and verse 1. Go with me to Psalm chapter 80 and verse 1. And in Psalm 80 and verse 1 to Helene 80, we read, O oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Yosef like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth. I think that um, David, when he wrote this, was picturing the mercy seat, the cherubim, and above those cherubim was the presence of God, the shepherd of Israel. Is that not a beautiful picture for us? We can also read in Bab Midbar, Numbers chapter 7 and 89. I want to show you that because that comes right out of our Torah. And we read in Numbers chapter 7, and we have to go all the way down to verse 89, a very long chapter. Uh, much of what we've been talking about is in this area also. Uh, but as we come down to verse 89, when Moshe went into the tent of meeting in order to speak with Adonai, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the ark cover on the ark for the testimony from between the two karovim, that, that's uh, cherry beam in our English, and he spoke to him. So the voice that Moshe would hear when he go into the, the tabernacle to hear the very voice of God would come to him out from between these cherry beam. This was the very midst of our God's dwelling, and his throne would be right there. It was held in place by that rim, by that crown of gold, speaking of his exaltation again, once again. And by the way, I think I uh, forgot to give you for the description of the mercy seat in our uh, um, Torah portion. It's in Shemot in Exodus chapter 25 verses 17 to 22, and we also read of it in chapter 37, verses 6 to 9. You can read those on your own, but there's another point that I need to bring out that's critically important for this, and that is the part about the blood, because right now we have the presence of God there, but what about the blood? What about the atonement that I have been speaking to you about? In Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 1, we have... Adonai spoke with Moshe after the death of Aharon's two sons when they tried to sacrifice before Adonai and died. This shows us the, the seriousness of our God that you do it in the way that God says. Two had come in, they tried to offer a sacrifice a way that they chose to do it rather than God's holy way, and it caused their death to come to them. Now drop down to verses 12 through 14 in Leviticus in Viacra. Uh, chapter 16, and we read starting with verse 12. He is to take, and this is the priest, is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before Adonai, and with his hands full of ground fragrant incense, bring it inside the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before Adonai so that the cloud from the incense will cover 
the ark cover, which is over the testimony, in order that he not die. What was happening bringing in that incense is God's presence was shining so brightly that remember how he told Moshe that you couldn't see God and live? And he put Moshe in uh, like the, the shadow of the rock and then he passed by and Moshe just saw what was left behind and even that was so much of a glow that his face just shone like, like nothing the people had ever seen before. So this incense was, in essence, like a smoke screen that kept that glory from blinding the high priest as he went in to bring in the blood that he was supposed to bring in. Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 11 tells us, um, if I'm in the right verse, Okay, actually what I want, I'm sorry, is Leviticus chapter 17, but before I go to that, since I... I'm going to have to come right back to chapter 16. Let me read to you first verses 29 and 30 of chapter 16, the chapter that we've been in. It is to be a permanent regulation for you that on the tenth day of the seventh month you're to deny yourselves, not do any kind of work, both the citizen and the foreigner living with you. For on this day atonement will be made for you to purify you. You will be clean before Adonai from all your sins. That's verses 29 and 30, and what we're being told is about Yom Kippur. That's the day of atonement, the holiest day on the Jewish calendar year. It was the one time during the whole year that the high priest would go inside that veil and put blood on the mercy seat that we might have that forgiveness that uh, was just referred to, that, that we um, are, to be, I lost my place where it is, that we would be clean, purified, before Adonai from all our sins. Now go with me to the very next chapter, to chapter 17. And it's keeping in the same line of thought, speaking to us about the same thing. In Leviticus, Viacra, chapter 17 and verse 11 says to us, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now we know that. We know that, that if you bleed someone out, they'll lose their life. The life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you on the altar to make an atonement for your souls. Now, we just read about that in chapter 16, that this was how the atonement was to be made. But we read about the high priest bringing the blood in, and we know it was the blood from the sacrificed animals that were substituting for man, but being a picture of the coming Lamb of God who would give his life. In, verse, in chapter 17 here, we're reading that, that I speaking, God speaking, I have given it to you on the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is by the blood, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. When did God put the blood on the altar? We know that that was done in the person of Yeshua, who I believe literally placed his blood on that mercy seat in heaven. We went through this before, so I won't go through the detail now but placed it in the heavenly, in the perfect, what earth was patterned after because he was making way open the heaven for us to be able to go into the very presence of our holy God when we leave this earth. While the high priest on earth put the, the blood in the holy place on earth once a year, this is the greater high priest, Hebrews tells us, the one who's gone through the veil, who has gone, passed through the heavens and through the veil, who has placed his blood on the mercy seat in the heavens that we might indeed have atonement for our souls. It is a sacrifice once and for all. It would not be repeated in another year. This high priest, Yeshua himself, would never die. We know that his, once he rose from the death that he, he um, endured on this earth for us, that he is eternally alive forever, never to repeat this. It is the final and complete perfect sacrifice that satisfied the holy God. That is amazing and it is the beauty of this tabernacle pointing to this thousands of years before it took place when Yeshua fulfilled it for us. Um, Roger, if we can go off the PowerPoint now, I don't think that we need it at this point. Um, if I'm wrong, I'll make you come back, but that way maybe we can have some eye contact. In Yohanan, in John, chapter 20, I want to take you uh, quickly in closing to chapter um, 20 of Yohanan and verse 17. 
Oh, okay. I did, I did bring it out, and I, just in case, if you didn't hear it before, where it shows us the difference, where I can say that he put this blood on the uh, mercy seat in heaven. After Yeshua had raised from the dead, the women had come to the tomb and found it empty. We have in verse 17, after Miriam is uh, speaking with Yeshua, not knowing yet it is Yeshua, when he calls her by name in verse 16, she realizes now that is her master who she loves. And she turns to him, calls him Rabbani, teacher, and she wants to grab hold of him. And our, our um, text tells us that he said, stop clinging to me because I've not yet gone back to the Father. Go tell my brothers, and that would be his Talmudim, tell them that I'm going um, back to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And then they're told that they would see him later in Galilee. So in verse 17, he stops her from holding on to him, says he's got to go do this. In verse 27 of the same chapter, we see that, that uh, he has appeared to Thomas now, to Toma, and he tells him to put his finger here. Look at my hands. Look, take your hand. Put it in my side. Don't be lacking in trust, but believe in me. We see that here he's offering one to touch him and to feel. And in fact, if we follow from the other Gospels, we see also that very shortly after the time with Miriam, he is seen by several women. And he, they do fall at his feet. They cling to his feet. They're praising him. And he does not stop them. Obviously, he had to have ascended to his father and come back just like he said he would do. This is not the, the ascension that we read about in Acts chapter 1. That will come 40 days later. But in that 40-day period, Yeshua is seen by his Talmudim. He's seen by the women. He's seen by a group of over 500 at one time. He is seen many times. There is more historical evidence for his resurrection than there is that George Washington lived. And yet today people want to claim George Washington and deny the resurrection of our Messiah and Savior. It is not as putting our faith in something that could be equated with a fairy tale. There is proof, there is living proof, and we know, those of us who have experienced uh, his coming into our life, the living God who is within us through the power of the Ruch HaKodesh who brings us into that abundant life, greater than what we can imagine at this point, and not even fully fulfilled and understood till we are home in heaven one day. But at that mercy seat, the only place in the whole tabernacle where there was a seat. Why? Because the priests never sat down. They had to continually do work. There was always work that was not finished. Yet when Yeshua died on the cross, his last words, he cried out, were in the Greek, tetelestai. In our English it means, it is finished. But I bring it to you from the Greek because the Greek is a language that gives us more depth of time and perception in there. And when it is said there, what he has said is, it has happened at this moment in time, it is finished, and the results will carry on forever. In geometry, it's your arrow that has the dot where it starts and then it shoots into infinity and it never ends. That is the present, that is the tense that he spoke when he said, it is finished. He was telling us the job was done once and for all. Again, not for a year, not for a day, not until something better came along. This was the best. This was satisfying because remember, it was God's justice that was demanding that there, there be, uh, how do I say this? What God's justice demanded, his love provided. What, that's what I'm trying to say, that, that it conquered um, the power that sin held over us and still holds over any who have not accepted, who have not gone within the veil through his shed blood, then they do not have this, but for any who have, the forgiveness is once and for all. We do not need to ask him repeatedly into our heart and into our lives. Yes, we confess to him when we still sin, because on this earth, as long as we're in our earthly bodies, sin is very present trouble. And as all Paul said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we know that we don't stay at that holy level of living. We cannot. So we do confess and thank him for forgiveness of our sin, but we never need to ask him to come in again. He has come in once and for all, and it's done through his work. Nothing that we could earn, 
nothing that we merit, we can never be good enough, who is to say what standard would be good enough? If we cannot keep all the commandments, then remember, if you break one, you've broken them all. God's holy standard is above our heads, and the only way up into that is through that shed blood. In closing, I'd like to read to you from the book of Hebrews again, written to our Hebrew people, chapter 10, and verse 14 says, For by a single offering he has brought to the goal for all time those who are being set apart for God and made holy. And then I'm going to drop down to verse 18. You can read all this in order on your own, but I'm just bringing out a couple of points quickly for us. Now, where there is forgiveness for these, an offering for sin is no longer needed. Once that blood has been placed, we have come through that blood, then our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. Does it give us the right to go sin and live it any way we want and not care? Of course not. Paul even says, may that never be. But what it gives us is eternal forgiveness so that we don't live in a moment of fear that if we slip and we're not doing something perfectly and we lose our lives, that we would lose our eternal salvation. You know, God promised it was everlasting. It is eternal. It is always. Because again, we're forgiven past, present, and future. But if we fully appreciate what He has done, we will come into such a relationship with Him that we will want to live every moment pleasing unto Him. In verse 23, it tells us, um, well, verse 22 is telling us that we have that heart sprinkled clean from a bad conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Remember, we came in reading that. And then verse 23, let us continue holding fast to the hope. And in Scripture, hope is a sure thing. It's not a I hope so. It's a no so. Holding fast to what we know, we acknowledge without wavering, for the one who made the promise is trustworthy. What that is saying is that it's Yeshua who we trust in. It's not in our own merits. It's not in shedding our blood. It is in the lifeblood of Yeshua who made the payment that fully satisfies a holy God. And he did it for mankind for all time. So the mercy seat represents to us Yeshua who is that propitiation, that atonement for our sins. Remember, in Leviticus, God said, I've given it to you on the altar, and it's the life that I've given you in the blood. That closes us off from our furniture and our tabernacle. If you remember in closing, and I don't know that Roger can get to the, the scene easily, next week I will show it to you because I have another part still to give us. But remember, we uh, looked all the way from the beginning, very close to the beginning, about the third slide, I think. We have the, the laying out in the form of the cross. We started at the foot of the cross. You're going to make them dizzy, but you'll get back to them. Well, that was one picture. You can go back to it. Go forward a couple. There we go. I see it coming up. There we are. Remember the furniture laid out in the cross, and we started at that brazen altar where the sacrifice was made, and now we've gone all the way through, even through the veil that speaks to life, and we find the life of the flesh is in the blood given on the altar, the mercy seat for the forgiveness of all. Is that not a beautiful love story? No greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for another. And we know this is what Yeshua has done for us, and I trust that this has been a blessing to you to uh, go through it. Whether it's your first time or your hundredth time, there's nothing that can cause the, the soul to rejoice more, I think, than to see in living color what the Lord has purchased for us. Now, next week I'll take us one last time through, uh, in relation to the tabernacle, the high priest's garments, because that also is a picture, and I believe it will complete our picture together for us. So we'll look at the tabernacle one more time, but we'll look at it from the angle of what the high priest is wearing. And that will include what he's wearing on his head as well as beneath. If you've not heard that study, come anticipating a great picture again like we see through the tabernacle. And if you do know it, hopefully it will be a blessing to you. But uh, uh, thank you for allowing us to go through this in such depth because in the wholeness of the picture, we come to, to begin to understand what the Lord has done for us. And uh, when you know this is literally the way into the very presence of God, then you rejoice and we say hallelujah. Bruce?
Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. Yeah. So, uh, again, just uh, thanks be to our God for us being able to be together in this way. Um, we'll uh, conclude by having the uh, ironic benediction, and then we're going to have some kind of open, open time, fellowship time, just to have a few minutes together, even though we can't, we would love to be able to replicate being able to stand around and talk one to another. This is going to be our chance just to uh, be together. So, um, Father, we do just thank you for tonight, and we thank you for our time, and for each person represented. Lord, we thank you that you love us and, and care for us in such a special way. We ask, Lord, that you would knit our hearts together and Lord, we thank you that you've given us a chance to, to think about you and think your thoughts after you. Lord, help us to be transformed from one degree of glory to the next as we, we forget about ourselves and focus on you. And we just worship you in spirit and truth as we're together tonight. Thank you, Lord. Amen.